Hollywood of today bears no relation to the Hollywood of the past, nor does it choose to remember. There are no streets named for the pioneers. No plaques identify their historic houses. History in Hollywood occurred too suddenly. The town was engulfed in rivers of concrete. Most of its past lies buried. In 1903, the village of Hollywood officially became a city. Now, the city fathers could regulate the driving of sheep, goats, and hogs through their dusty streets. They could also ban the building of any kind of factory in their rural paradise. There was only one industry they overlooked. The movies. years, the film companies clustered together in one small town, turning it into a studio city. It was said to be the most glamorous spot in the country. Its name was Fort Lee, New Jersey. Fort Lee lay just across the river from New York. It was in the big cities with the largest populations that the film industry began. Despite the smoke and steam, films were made on rooftops, for sunshine was essential. This elaborate platform could revolve to follow the sun. Those that couldn't had to stop work when the evening shadows appeared. As the industry prospered, so it expanded. The established producers banded together to protect their wealth from the new independent filmmakers. They were called the Patents Trust. As well as hiring lawyers, the trust hired strong arm men to harass the independents. They hijacked cars, seized cameras and wrecked equipment. The independents retaliated. They too used gangsters. They often doubled as bit players. With gangsters on the payroll, what could be more natural than to make gangster pictures? Hoodlums could appear with a gun suddenly and take away the camera or shoot it. They found that by shooting holes through the cameras, they could stop their use. And that became their favorite method. The independents soon began quarreling among themselves. Filmmaking in the big cities degenerated into a hit-and-run affair. It's had a history from the very outset of piracy, robbing. Everybody was violating everybody else's patents, but all in secret, you know, behind the scenes. And uh, there were early days when bicycling prints from one theater to the other. While well, theater A is running reel one, theater B has got reel three and the guys are bicycling the print all over town. And then they run it through a laboratory and dupe it and steal it. <laughs> so everybody had a hand in the till. Studios caught fire with startling regularity. Sometimes arson. Sometimes accident, for the nitrate film stock was highly explosive. 
The independent Tannhauser studios were destroyed by fire. The company had to deliver a film that week, whatever happened. So they improvised a little drama and carried on working. But the outlook for the independents was bleak. They had to get away. California provided a blissful contrast. It was comparatively safe, and there was sunshine 350 days a year. If the landscape had changed, the plots were much the same. The Flying A Company made their pictures near the Mexican border. A private detective from the Patents Trust tracked them down. Guarded by armed cowboys, the Morrison brothers, director Alan Dwan was ready for him. One day, a fella got off the train, sleek looking character, and asked to see the boss and I, being the boss, saw him, and he said, uh, I want to have a talk with you. I said, all right. I suspected him. And I said, let's walk up the road a bit. So we did. We walked up about a mile and came to an arroyo, a little stream running under the bridge, into which people had tossed a lot of tin cans. And he had said to me, we want you to get out of town. We want you to quit making pictures here and just forget it, because you've got your warning. And to impress me, he whipped out a sidearm and fired at one of the tin cans in the Arroyo. And I immediately whipped mine out and fired, and he had missed his, but I hit mine three times, three different cans, of course, and probably 50 feet at least away from where I was aiming. But it was impressive to see the cans dance. And I said, did you want to try that now? I had my gun in my hand, and he put his back in his pocket, so I, I was very brave. But he said, no, I'll see you tomorrow. And he turned around to, toward the depot and ran right into the three Morrison brothers with three Winchester rifles aimed at him and decided it was about time to leave town. After the incident, the company made a one real film about it, but they added a sequence of wishful thinking. Picture people were being attracted to California slowly but surely. Companies on the run chose remote areas. Legitimate concerns settled around the cities. Los Angeles proved a magnet because of its cheap labor. Hollywood was famous only for its fruit. A wealthy couple from Kansas, Mr. and Mrs. Wilcox, had purchased an orchard in the valley. Mrs. Wilcox named it Hollywood after an estate she'd heard about in the East. Mr. Wilcox's passion was real estate. He subdivided the property. Wilcox ensured that those who bought his land were upright and respectable citizens, God-fearing abstainers like himself. Hollywood was not a community that would welcome the movies. Hollywood is practically unknown to the world. The word Hollywood was seldom heard with a distance beyond, say, 10 miles of this little village. Eight miles away was the city of Los Angeles. A studio had opened here in 1907, and from 1909, D.W. Griffith came out each winter using a studio next to a streetcar barn. He also took his company on location. These are the earliest surviving pictures photographed in the streets of Hollywood. The actor on the right is the future comedy producer, Max Sennett. This scene shows the area north of Hollywood Boulevard. It is 1910, and so far there are no studios. The Hollywood itself is the place we went to on the big red streetcars, or drove to if we had an automobile, and worked in. and left in the evening when the sun went down and left it peaceful and quiet. There 
mother went to work in a hotel in Los Angeles, she met movie people that uh, were coming out to investigate possibilities of making movies in California. So uh, they asked her where a good place was. But she mentioned Edendale right away because we lived there. We liked it. It was the climate was fine. So sure enough, they came out, looked at uh, at the little valley, and uh, it became uh, one of the early motion picture studios. Nearby was the village of Hollywood, which had recently decided to ban liquor. The Blondel Roadhouse lost business as a result. The owner was only too happy to lease it to some picture people from New Jersey. It was 1911. The motion picture industry had finally arrived in Hollywood. The entire company lined up for its first group photograph. Two years later, Cecil B. DeMille came out from New York with the Lasky Feature Play Company and directed The Squaw Man from an old livery stable on Vine Street. It was Hollywood's first feature-length production. DeMille's publicity boasted that he'd traveled 2,000 miles across five states to find locations for The Squaw Man. In fact, he found them all within driving distance of Hollywood. The big city, the seaport, the open range, the mountains, the snow country, and the desert. California had everything. Cecil B. DeMille was so enthusiastic that his brother William came west with his family, including his daughter Agnes. To them all, Hollywood seemed a paradise. The streets ran right into the foothills, and the foothills went straight up into the sagebrush, and you were in the wild, wild hills. Rattlesnakes and coyotes and the little wild deer that came down the sagebrush in the rain, the eucalyptus in the rain. You see, the spring was such a marvelous thing there. When the rains came, within two weeks, what had been brown was suddenly all green. And the grass there is so strong with a virility somehow that is just exciting. And in the grass would be tangled the lupin, the poppies, the brodea. All of them are exquisite. And all of them just blooming wild and in the gutter and in the open fields between your schoolhouse and the next house. Flowers everywhere. And up in the hills, just blowing mariposa tulips, brodea. I cannot tell you. You gathered them by the armful. and more people came from the east to make pictures in the sun. In the early days, the porters would all toss poppy seeds along the train or the track. And as you approach California, it was in my days, these two yellow streams, like ribbon, all up the, the Cajon Pass, the mountains there. It was just like heaven with two beautiful welcome arms, just saying, come to, come to California. And of course, in my romantic way, I, I, I responded, you see. I was so grateful I was getting out to California where they really made pictures. a Civil War picture. I can remember my uncle going out as a soldier. You know, he was so pleased to put on a uniform and, uh, and get his uh, dollar for the dollar a day they were getting. 
And I remember the first time we'd seen paper money. Uh, everything on the West Coast uh, was gold or silver. And when he came home with this uh, dollar uh, piece of paper money, as which, what the movie people were using, he thought it was a, a fake. He didn't know it was any good. Easterners had other curious ways. On vacant lots, they built wooden platforms. These open stages were as basic as the rooftops of New York and depended as much on sunshine. We used old buildings, barns, anything available that would house our equipment. We had no electric light. They were all open air shots. When it was raining, there'd be a rush to grab a piece of furniture and get it in out of the rain until the rain would pass. And then we put it out again, shoot a few scenes. wires were, they would put canvas so they could pull it across. In case you had an interior, the sun wouldn't be shining down on the table and <laughs> casting shadows. We managed, uh, but the wind would blow the tablecloth and things that shouldn't be blowing, but people didn't mind. With a backyard and a bungalow, you could build a studio. And you had your own picture company. There were no unions, no uh, casting organizations, none of the order and regimentation we have today. So people gathered at the gates to see if they could get work, a few people. And if our gates uh, were not available or not open, they'd rush off to the next little place where they had a gate. We would sometimes be at the studio till 8 or 10 o'clock at night and walk home and stand on the corner and talk about pictures and how to do this and overacting and, uh, and overexposure and all these things till, for two and three hours. The pictures that you worked on in those days, the money wasn't there. There was no union, so there was no time. You worked Sundays and holidays, no extra pay. But it was a family. It was a very close-knitted group of people. Everybody would help each other. They wouldn't try to hinder you or push you down. It was just everybody at work. And it was fun. It was real fun. us felt that we were out here permanently. We all felt that we'd probably be sent back to New York, you know, to the studios back there. So the Hollywood Hotel was the only place to live at that time. And um, we'd stay at the hotel until we'd find a house to rent for maybe six months. And after that was up, the rent was up, or the, the six months was up, back to the Hollywood Hotel we'd go. The permanent community was very unhappy at this invasion. Residents were horrified <laughs> because they were very modest people, mostly from the Middle West of America. So when they saw this troop of scallywags show up, they thought the community was being harmed. Well, they would ride the horses across the lawn, cowboys with chaps and all like that, and when they're gone, why, uh, they, the owners were very much disturbed about it. So that, they, they looked, they sort of downgraded the motion picture people uh, in, in the, uh, generally. The residents used a disparaging word for the film people. They called them the movies. They were really outcasts, and uh, they lived in Hollywood, 
and people found them extremely picturesque and quite interesting and amusing, especially the Keystone cops or the Max Sennett cops, because they just simply take any street they wanted and stop a trolley car and do what they had to do and beat everybody on the head with cotton clubs and leave by the time the police had arrived. But uh, all that was fun, but it wasn't socially acceptable. And the people that were in movies, they were absolutely, well, I, I, kn I knew what racial discrimination was because I was a movie, you see? The problem was so acute, they even made a film about it. A property man asks the landlady if he can borrow her spinning wheel. Good heavens, no. Prop men, however, don't take no for an answer. The landlady sets out to recover her heirloom. Whenever they finished a picture, which would be roughly every week, you know, they, were, they didn't waste time. They just got ahead and shot it. Not always with a scenario. Then they'd run it. They'd paste it together and run it. And they asked everybody, all the families, all the children, all the cousins, neighbors sometimes, come in, come in, see our picture. We're running it. And then they'd ask everybody what they thought. I cannot believe that it was that simple, but it was. And I think some of that simplicity and some of that fervor and excitement is in the films. And that's why they're valuable and lovely. This Max Sennett comedy parodied the melodrama of the period. The girl is Gloria Swanson. was great excitement and great fervor and great sense of romance, romantic adventure. They didn't know what they were working in. They didn't know what the future would be. They didn't know what they were doing. They knew that every picture broke boundaries. Some one new thing would be done, a new way of handling the camera, a new way of cutting, a new way of lighting. And they'd be so excited by it. And my father used to say always, we are not real artists, none of us. We are like the pre-Elizabethan dramatists, 
They were not real playwrights. They were not really great poets. But they made it possible for the next generation and the generation after to become great artists and great poets. And he said, I think there are coming great artists in this medium. But we haven't, we don't know what it is. The residents of Hollywood watched in amazement as the industry changed their landscape. Among their bungalows, D.W. Griffith was at work on some vast, mysterious epic. The film was eventually called Intolerance. Never had so much money been invested in a single picture. It established a new confidence. Once again, Griffith had taken the movies into another era. spectacle were now synonymous with Hollywood. Cecil B. DeMille, impressed by intolerance, made Joan the Woman, his version of the story of Joan of Arc. the scale, the film was still a family affair. All of the families went with basket lunches, and we went in a procession, an autocade, I think you'd call it, to go home, and we got stuck. And we got stuck just where the men began changing their clothes. Now, you have to remember this was long ago, and when ladies, and little girls especially, were brought up to believe that the human body simply does not exist between the upper thigh and the shoulder. There's a blank, and uh, we never saw anything. Never did. I mean, honestly, really, truly, and weren't supposed to. And suddenly, here are a lot of naked men who didn't give a damn about taking their pants off or whatever and getting into whatever they were going home in, and they just did it. Well, don't look, said Mother, don't look. It's as though we were sinking on a ship, and she said, keep a step up a lip and just keep your mind on God. <laughs> Made just before America entered the war, Joan the Woman was propaganda for the Allies. And this battle echoed the conflicts raging at that very moment on the Western Front in France. By the end of the war, the European film industry had collapsed. Hollywood became the center of world film production. 90% of all pictures shown in foreign countries were American. Several countries tried to resist the flow, especially Germany, whose own industry was now slowly recovering. But however fine their homemade product, 
the public preferred Hollywood stars. They showed their true allegiance at the box office. And the very streets of Hollywood became the most familiar in the world. Simply by showing California on the screen, the movies had created a real estate boom of historic proportions. From a rural community, Hollywood had spread into a factory town. The stars and their mansions attracted tourists, who sent postcards like these around the world. These were the homes of Buster Keaton, Paula Negri, William S. Hart, Douglas MacLean. The most publicized building was named Pickfair by the press. It was the home of Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. Visiting dignitaries would come to America. They, they wanted to go to Hollywood and they wanted to see Douglas, Mary, and Charlie Chaplin. Well, Pickfair became the center, and, and the king and queen of Siam stayed there, and oh, M Mary has a, a, a guest book just filled with the marvelous names of that. Lord and Lady Mountbatten spent part of their honeymoon at Pickfair. At the time of their reign in Pickford, they were treated like royalty, and in fact, they behaved in the same sort of dignified way as royalty did. And they also fulfilled the role, of, as I say, of, of running the sort of very loose sort of society that would have been in Hollywood in those days. They were a great unifying force, and I think a great force for the good. On the lawn at Pickfair, a Hollywood wedding for Jack Pickford, Mary's film star brother. Overhead, an aeroplane had showered the house with white roses. Outside the gates, 2,000 uninvited guests watched and waited. Pickfair, which is what, certainly the best taste house, not the biggest, most ornate, but the best taste house I think in Hollywood. And it was run very much on English country house lines, and in fact, they really kept court there. It was like Buckingham Palace in London. Douglas Fairbanks set out to make a lavish costume picture, Robin Hood. The sets were gigantic and almost caused the film to be scrapped, for they were even larger than those built for intolerance. And that was just out of sight for a motion picture set. Nobody had ever heard of anything like that. But they were magnificent. We were quite proud of them. And drove Doug over to the studio, and as he approached it, he saw these huge things sticking up in the air, the sets. He said, what in the world is that? He said, those are your sets for Robin Hood. Well, he got as far as the gate of the studio, and he took a look in through the gate at these big sets. 
and he backed the car off and said, take me home. He said, you can forget it. He said, I wouldn't go near those damn things, those big sets. He says, what would I do? I am a personality actor. People want me for my smile, for what I do, my personality, not for those big things. They swamp me. But Duan persuaded him to change his mind. Relying on Fairbanks' fondness for spectacular stunts, he described a fight sequence to him. 10 or 20 men attack you, and you keep them at bay with your sword. Now on the balcony, you jump up on the railing. This is 50 feet above the floor of the stage. And you're caught between two groups, all the swords. Then I stop. He said, yeah. Then what do I do? Did he kill me there, huh? That's the end of the picture. I said, no. You escape. How? Jump down 50 feet, I said, practically. And I had rigged a big curtain of uh, burlap, and I said, as they close in on you, you jump into that burlap. And I jumped into it. Under it was a scoop that we use for kids at the beaches. So as I hit it, I slid gracefully to the floor of the thing 50 feet below, took one of his stances with my sword and stuck my thumb and my nose at the vent up above. But when Doug saw that, he couldn't wait to go onto the stairs and try it. And he jumped off two or three times, and then he began to telephone to his friends, he knows, to come around and see how a stunt he was going to do. And he jumped off that balcony until he practically wore out the burlap. Not only were the sets larger, but the studios also expanded. And the landscape of Hollywood changed. The studios even gave birth to brand new towns around them. The Goldwyn Studios dominated Culver City. Bigger and better was Hollywood's slogan of the moment. Soon every city boasted what were known as temples of the silent drama. The theater changed from the Nickelodeon to the, what they call the motion picture palace. And therefore they had beautiful interiors with nice carpeting, comfortable seats. And most people were better situated in a theater than they were in their own home. No one's home could compare with a picture palace, except Cleopatra's or the Kubla Khan's. Here in New York, we had the Roxy holding 6,400 people. They put in great orchestras. We taught America to listen to good music. They did a world of good around the world because combined, silent film and music were the universal language, and America controlled films of the world. <laughs> It was the 20s, the jazz age, flappers and frivolity. A time whose spirit Scott Fitzgerald caught in his novels. Hollywood aimed film after film at this new market. The original screen flapper was Colleen Moore. Oh, what Scott Fitzgerald said. Let me see now, how did I go? I was the spark that lit up flaming youth, and Colleen Moore was the torch. What little things we are to have caused that conflagration. <laughs> Pictures now dictated fashions. They created markets for perfumes and cosmetics. They even altered people's shape. Colleen, of course, had a complete change of appearance to any woman that had ever been famous as a beauty. The women that were famous as beauties at that time were buxom, and they had little waists and large bosoms and lots of hair, mostly in curls. And uh, Colleen came along, and she was skinny and flat like a boy, and she began to wear her hair straight. I cut it the first time with a pair of copy shears. <laughs> Everybody put their hair up in curlers, and we thought it'd be fun if they stopped. So we cut her hair short, and oh yes, the first bangs. 
Those were the first bangs that anybody ever had on the screen. I know after Flaming Youth, which was the first flapper picture, my hair cut <laughs> went around the world. <laughs> and I didn't tell them I stole it from a Japanese doll. <laughs> The first and greatest influence had been a star with a very different image. The best known woman that has ever lived, the woman who was known to more people and loved by more people than any other woman that ever has been in all history, was a little movie star named Mary Pickford. When Mary Pickford married Douglas Fairbanks in 1920, they visited Europe on their honeymoon. They had no idea of the welcome that awaited them. I think the attraction was that never before or since in the whole history of the world was it possible for so many people to have known and become familiar with a, a shadow romantically uh, presented and immensely popular in what they were able to do and here suddenly these people became real life characters they, they were flesh and blood mary pickford was the first star to become a millionaire but that was one role she never played They were mobbed. Well, I don't think the Beatles know anything about popularity compared to those two. When Fairbanks and Pickford first went to London, they had a whole ring of bobbies around them, and he picked her up finally and put her on his shoulder, and they asked, all of them ran. It got past the point where it was pleasant. Mary Pickford's most famous attribute was her long golden curls. They set the first of the movie's fashion trends. even in the austere society of Soviet Russia. The influence of Hollywood was irresistible. 
When Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks visited Moscow in 1926, they were overwhelmed. The Russians even made a film out of the tour. A kiss from Mary Pickford. It was a comedy. A cinema usher dreams of winning the love of Mary Pickford. The Russians persuaded her to pose with their comedian and to kiss him. They then built the entire film around this one shot. With her lipstick on his cheek, he becomes the object of star worship himself. The acclaim crossed political barriers. Hollywood's silent films had now become the world's single most powerful cultural influence. They could show them everywhere in the world. Anywhere, it didn't matter what the language was. They were pantomime. Now at last we were all one people all around the world and we had one language. And Hollywood was it. In the midst of Hollywood appeared a still more fantastic city. Douglas Fairbanks built it for the thief of Baghdad. He lays siege to it with a legion conjured by magic from the earth itself. Everybody had an excitement about the whole thing that I've never seen since. Uh, none of us knew <laughs> even vaguely what we were doing. None of us had any idea that this picture business had come to be the greatest in, while it lasted, all those early great days, the greatest form of art and entertainment that the world has ever known was put together for a while.